esteemed Sri Anantho is a spellbinding address. I think uh, you remember this wisdom uh, for a long time. Sri Sudhakar Varnasi, Sharma Jain and his gracious lady, Sri Fulvashati, Dr. Bhagavad, very respected and distinguished by this. Ladies and gentlemen, I am grateful to Ram Prakash for the, this invitation to me to be with you this morning. I remember that uh, way back after the Second World War, that threw up such atrocities against humanity. The whole world was shaken. The United Nations set up a committee to look into the philosophy of human rights and set up a committee to draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the chairmanship of Eleanor Roosevelt. There is a French jurist and internationalist, <laughs> Professor René Cazin, who was the chief draftsman of that committee. The committee gave its report after four years of deliberation. And on the 10th of December 1948, the Third General Assembly of the United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. By a felicitous coincidence that the same day, 10th of December 1968, Professor Kassim was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. On that occasion, somebody, some journalist, uh, accosted him and said, Why do you want uh, a universal declaration of human rights? In perhaps the greatest uh, understatement of the century, he said, We need human rights because men are not always good. He didn't say women, men are not always good. I think that's a fitting epitaph on the grave of the 20th century. Men are not, men not always good. In that century, we have killed 230 million people, 160 million in wars, and another 70 million in stripes, not unrelated to ethnicity, language, religion, and a whole host of things that divide man from man. 230 million people killed, and the epitaph with this, and the grave of the 20th century, that, that men are not always good. Eleanor had a bottle of champagne. She wanted to share it after the document was signed. The draft of the human rights was signed. It took four years. Russian said human rights are God given, somebody suggested. Russian said there's no God, there's no human rights at all. The Arab League did not sign it. They never believed in this. Somehow they were able to manage and then they prepared a draft. And on the day it was signed, Eleanor opened her bottle of champagne. It had turned sour. Why not become vinegar? And she she exhorted, if you keep human humanism bottled up for long, it will turn sour. It has turned sour now more than any time else in, the, in our history. Then if you examine the the history of man. In all the great major disasters of our civilizations, what has contributed is not the selfishness of man. On the contrary, it is unselfish dedication to a cause, to a leader, to a slogan, to a religion, and to some kind of a faith that he 
is being induced to believe in human structure, the hierarchical system, the human brain itself is such that it is not, not selfishness, but it is unselfish, unthinking, blind respect for a slogan, for a leader, for a language, for a cause that has created all this kind of uh, terrible things in the world. And um, to attribute man's role, the individual role is insignificant. His collective role is the most responsible thing. You see the behavior of a mob and each one of them is a great human being. You talk to him one to one. When he's in a, in, collectively together, it is impossible to imagine what they are prepared to do. This kind of thing is civilizing thinking. And as uh, the professor spoke so lovely, so gently, so admonishingly that, uh, that we have to look into ourselves, that uh, it's not uh, a race for higher living, it's higher life. And I think Ram Prakash will say, a center for higher life. And the Aramark say, not higher living. We have mistaken higher life for higher living. And um, this is the problem which is haunting our civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, when the, there's, um, there's one professor, uh, Indian of Indian origin, who teaches in the West, uh, professor of neurology. He delivered a city, he wrote a book called Phantoms in the Brain a long time ago. And subsequently he delivered um, lectures in the BBC, the read lectures. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, he in that uh, read lecture, um, uh, emerging mind in the total uh, six or seven lectures. There's one beautiful um, uh, talk. Believing is seeing, if not seeing is believing. And that's a very interesting thing about the ophthalmology of vision. And he says that if you see a flower, this physiology of vision says that the cornea acts as a lens, the retina as a screen, the picture of that uh, um, flower is on the retina and the screen, the, the optic nerve takes that stimulation to one of the 37 visual cortices in the back of the head, in the back of the brain, and that visual cortex will say, this is a flower. He says, this is entirely wrong. You see the retina, the picture of the, the flower of the retina, it is all scattered. Nobody can say it's a flower. It is, the petal is somewhere, the pistil is somewhere, the pollen is somewhere, it's all scattered. And this stimulation goes to the anterior, I mean, the, the uh, visual cortex. That cortex has no brain of its own. Unless you have known earlier it's a flower, you can't say it's a flower. It's the reverse of scientific uh, rationalization. This is something which is uh, perhaps um, something is yet to be taught to science. This kind of uh, thinking is yet to be taught to science. There's a, I picked up a small book on the table of my grandson the other day. The, the book is uh, called Seven Brief Lessons in Physics. It's by an Italian author, Carlo Rovelli. It's translated to English. So if you read that book, you're amazed at our ancient wisdom and the intuitive astronomy that our great scientists of the past did. In fact, we remember 250 years before Christ, there was one librarian, a philosopher from Greece, who was the librarian of the Alexandria University. Uh, he was uh, sometime uh, 368 BC to 298 BC or so, somewhere there. Without any instrument, watching the shades, he calculated the distance between the Earth and the Venus exactly to the last last kilometer. In fact, um, that was said today, I, whenever I go and meet the young people, why don't you uh, do that experiment? He did it. Why don't you see what he, what's the process by which he achieved it? He, there's no telescope, there's no instrument, nothing. 
and uh, it's not intuition. It is pure observation, ability of the the cognitive mind to know what what is happening and draw an appropriate conclusions from it. Children are not taught. In fact, you you ask something you know, a simple thing in arithmetic, you take the calculator and then that's it. I suppose this is a sure way of atrophy of the brain. You see, you can, you, if you don't use it, you lose it. This is the atrophy by disuse. And I think humanity is in a dangerous place, burst on the brink of something which you are going to lose forever. Higher life is something to do with it. Something when you have liberal arts and you have a sense of uh, um, artistic side of the uh, human imagination, how it nourishes your life, how it can. The other day, um, um, somebody, I, when I was in Delhi, I spent 15 lousy years in Delhi, but I did two or three good things. I was the founding, uh, founder chairman of a society called um, Sarvodaya International Trust, of which a number of eminent people, including Princess Irene of Greece, she was one of my trustees, um, um, Ranali Sarabhai, who passed away recently, she was uh, new, um, Gandhi's grandson with, with, with us, Ayavashal Ajahn Singh was with me, and it's in the way in which the one of the books of my managing trustee, uh, Alan Nazareth wrote, is translated into 37 languages. 37 languages internationally. There's another society which I am most guilty of uh, founding, Kalidas Khalib Society. And uh, the first lecture was a Muslim scholar from Madhya Pradesh. It was breathtaking. I think uh, I, I have not heard a, an analysis of the analogy of, uh, of um, Kalidas and Khalib, the sense of humor and the sense of um, uh, sense of beauty of uh, this thing. He described an um, uh, episode in in Kumar Sambhava of Kalidasa when this uh, woman Parvati lives and dried leaves to achieve um, uh, proximity with Lord Shiva. Uh, then the intensity of her tapasya and devotion was such that Shiva himself came in disguise before her and began to abuse uh, Shiva himself. He said, why are you after this man? He is in a burial ground, smears his body with the ashes of dead, uh, dead bodies, burnt bodies, and he has an elephant skin on his back, and he's so harsh and uh, cruel looking. You are after him. After sheer disgust, she gets up and wants to go away and lifts her leg to put it outside and go. At just the time he pulls the stem, the hem of her sari and says, I am Lord Shiva of myself. I have become, I have become your slave on account of your devotion. The, the, the transformation of our emotions from one of disgust and anger and uh, resentment to one of fulfillment and satisfaction, she forgets whether to put the lifted leg outside or take it back. The description of that episode, the emotions of this, I, I, this is a Muslim scholar, I forget his name. Um, it is something uh, outstanding. This kind of liberal arts, a touch of liberal arts in our education, how you can't expect this kind of uh, governments composed with uh, such elements that we see today. They have no imagination about it. You can't blame them. They are uh, not uh, immoral, they are amoral. They don't know what, what, what to do to society, what enriches life, and what doesn't. And this institute, I think, I'm sure, will uh, have great values about uh, aware of what we need to supplement our anchor We of our generation have lost. We are, I think, the hope lies in the younger generation. I have always been telling our friends here, get our postgraduate students, the age group was 18 to 25, let them be exposed to what kind of thinking 
Mr. Anantu has ex expressed how gently and how uh, inoffensively he has told us where we are missing our own pathways. Ladies and gentlemen, this, uh, I, I have, uh, we have the, in the Hindu practices, the Jnana Marga, the, the Bhakti Marga and the, the, the Karma Marga. Christians are the identical pathways. The Jnana Marga, they call it the crosses. The, the Bhakti Marga, they call it the Paitas. The, the Karma Marga, they call it the Energia. Gnosis, Paitas and Energia. The identical threefold division in the Islam. The Hakikat, the Manifat and the Sharia. Sharia is the Karma Marga. You do this, you do this, this, this thing. There's a beautiful confluence of thinking of these things. And we have erected the same principles of unity into a kind of, not mere diversity, it's a matter of um, oppositions of each other. I'm amazed to think that in this, see, please imagine 20,000 years ago what the genetic man was. What was his propensities, what was his inclinations, what was his intuitions and what his compulsions. Just today, the same genetic man. And how the moral evolution is not a natural process. But what has happened to man, genetic man today, compared to what he was 20,000 years ago. And see the acceleration of this process. And I think in the last 20 years, the change of the genetic man into the modern child is something amazing. The intuitive power of the child without our recognizing it is immense. You give a computer into his hands, you will see it this way, that way. Give him two hours time, he knows everything about it. He knows every operation without knowing any theory about it. And he will give it back to you, there is nothing in it, take it away. He, and you when he toy, he, he breaks it down. In fact, somebody brought my grandson a beautiful instrument from outside. He went down, ripping it open. Then he was all into his pieces at the table. His mother was shouting at him. He said, wait, I have to assemble it. He took a course sometime because it's difficult. My son assisted him. He put it back into it and said, take to his mother and said, don't get angry, take it. This, I watch this kind of transformation. It's just a time to catch them. And the institute of higher life must spread out its wings, take these children in, and then build uh, the sense of beauty, sense of uh, truth uh, into in their heads when they are young. And this is where um, perhaps our task is forget about our age. Of course, my age is gone. I'm only getting into my in a couple of months into my 90th year, and I've written myself off. There's no problem about it. But what about this beautiful children? We have 40% of our demographic profile children below 14 years. You can imagine what what it means for 1,300 million people. 40% of it are our future. They are uh, really uh, intellectual, economic and social future, future of our planet. And what are we doing to them? What are we telling them? And in the former days when we went to villages, my grandfather, the, judge, the day he retired, he went back to his village, started all kinds of things. And all his children, the he started. A windmill, he started something for his night school and he brought a generator and electrified some of the places in the village and he was a rich man, therefore he could afford all that foolishness. And uh, the way in which he thought, and in fact he got a little shot of his eyes were affected in the early 30s. Um, say, in, 36 to 51, every 41. Every day I used to read the editorial of the Hindu to him. He would give me a banana for it. He would keep it under the pillow. After he listened to it, I should carefully, without disturbing it, take it away. 
And sometimes it's too deep in the pillow, I could miss it out. But every article in Hindu I read, ever since I continue to it, so that in the 125th year of Hindu's anniversary, they invited me to write an article, write a piece on the editorials. And they published it, those shattering editorials. And put all those editorials I refer to, remember, in, in the a kind of a zigzag printing and the whole, whole sheet of paper. One of them was about a, a politician, uh, Ramlan was the president of governor of Hyderabad, how he prevented N.T. Ramarov from assuming power, though he had the majority of members in the assembly. Of course, Indra Gandhi was a great uh, tactician and a great politician. She wouldn't allow him to take office. Uh, all kinds of things were being done. Hindu wrote an editorial and the caption of it was a governor the nation can do without. A governor the nation can do without. It's such a shattering piece. Next day Indira Gandhi relented and allowed, allowed um, Ram Rao to assume office. And um, it was such a beautiful example of how a uh, pen is certainly far more uh, mightier than the sword. This is a kind of a journalism, the philosophy of journalism, of education, of nature, a whole host of things, art, music, dance, drama, everything that enriches the soul must be a, a part of this, uh, this uh, uh, higher life, uh, concept of higher life. Um, and not necessarily that high, a kind of standards of living have to be brought down. Uh, some standards of living are necessary. And I, to say that when we go back to the old days of living, it's not possible that the every river is polluted. You have to have a RO to have some life sustaining water. Everything is, uh, you will have to have organic food. You can't trust the kind of uh, mass production of food and things like that. And uh, the, in the Bhagavad Mahapuran, there is, a, there is a beautiful uh, chapter of a dialogue between the mother and son, Devakuti and Kapil Muni. The mother addresses the son as Prabhu. He was the incarnation of Vishnu according to the superstition and faith. They say, how do I worship? <coughs> Kapil Muni tells the mother, I am manifest as God Every human being is the temple in which I reside as the indwelling divinity. If you don't worship me there in the, in the frame of every individual, every human being, you can't come to me with rich gifts and this, I won't accept it. This is where one of the Upanishads tell us, Eko Avarno, one who is colorless and who, who cuts to the needs and that, aspirations of Anekan were not for everyone. The message is that you must all be united. United in what? United in the wisdom of goodness. So that's a beautiful expression of joining this, um, of, of uniting um, the beauty of uh, the wisdom of goodness. Be good. And Tokran said, my dear friend, do not be just, do not be just, please be simply kind. This is the message. And Tokran, she said, truth and justice have a shining light in their strength. Denied at once to falsehood and deceit. You just say truth and justice. You, the other man understands in the same spirit in which I uttered those words. And this universalization of the meaning of truth and justice is the essence of the task of the of the institute for higher learning. Thank you very much.